This video is sponsored by Raycon. As you guys know, I'm doing these reviews completely uh, blind. What? And so, all I see when I look at my bookshelf is a clear delineation between two colors, white and black. These obviously represent two separate parts of Naruto, and because I only had one arc left in the white section, I was interested to see just how Kishimoto would end this part of the story. And I'm gonna be honest, I also looked at this last arc, and instead of seeing just a story, I saw eight full volumes for me to finish reading before I could begin writing this video. However, once I finished this arc, I noticed something. Something I had harshly criticized this story for not having has now become one of its strongest attributes. Today, I want to share with you all my first impressions and review for the final arc of original Naruto, and what an arc it is. Remember when I said that I looked on with concern at the eight full volumes of manga I had to read and review this week? Well, what an idiot I was. The material in these volumes are easily some of the most simple in terms of story, but also have, I think, the very best paneling and layout work from Kishimoto that I've seen yet, making the entire process of reading deceptively quick and seamless. I'm telling you, I was slamming volumes like pints at Christmas. Often when it comes to the artists behind these famous mangas, the development or change of their respective artistic approaches styles, occurs unconsciously and gradually over time. Jojo, Dragon Ball, and One Piece are clear and striking examples of this phenomenon. Comparing their work from the beginning of their run to their most recent stuff highlights my point. Natural changes occur. And while some of this can explain part of what's happened to Kishimoto's work here as a mangaka, I think there's also a very conscious effort being exerted here. In the beginning of volume 20, Kishimoto vents his frustrations with the manga format, drawing from top right to bottom left calling it limiting. And this frustration can be felt in the volumes concerning this section specifically, sporting gorgeous pages and panels that really grab my attention, the likes of which I haven't seen much from Kishimoto at all. It's wonderful to see a mangaka 200 chapters into his career still trying to push himself to innovate. But what's interesting about this change compared to the aforementioned mangaka is that Kishimoto's transition is directly influenced by the very thing that's trying to mimic him. That's right, Kishimoto was directly influenced by Naruto's anime's character designer, Tetsuya Nishio. He saw some amazing design work coming from Nishio on the anime and loved how it seemed like such a great mix of seinen and shonen styles. He thought it was the ideal art style he'd been looking for, and ever since, he'd been mimicking Nishio's drawings. In a lot of these author notes sections, Kishimoto brings up many famous animators such as Hiroyuki Okiura, who worked on super famous scenes on things like Ghost in the Shell and Akira, which makes me think he's a bit of an animation nut. I mentioned one particular animator who has largely defined what Naruto Naruto action is, and that's Norio Matsumoto. Sasuke vs Orochimaru, Rock Lee vs Gara, Orochimaru vs the third Hokage, and now Naruto vs Sasuke. All these iconic scenes come from this man, and as I've watched those and continued to read, I've noticed Kishimoto's work beginning to resemble the energy and posing found in Matsumoto's work. I can only theorize about his influence here, but given Kishimoto's love of animation, it seems like a safe bet. Having already achieved so much notoriety in the industry, with so many people at this point looking up to him, I think it's a great sign of a mangaka and a person to be able to look outward and inward for a means to try and improve himself. It really does seem like the more I learn about Kishimoto as a person, the more I realize how close he is to Naruto as a character. <laughs> to the prior arc's activity with the assault in the village after being dealt with and the selection of the latest Hokage after being finalized, I was fully expecting this arc to feel like a footnote after everything that's happened. I was wrong. Despite being one of the longest arcs among the material I've covered so far, the story in question is remarkably simple, which meant that a lot of space was given to this arc's various components to breathe, build up, and climax appropriately. And boy, do they climax appropriately. The first act of this arc is the one that carries most of the heavy lifting from an expository and foundational sense, upon which the rest of the arc launches from comfortably. That said, the rest of this arc consists of a series of fights and chase scenes, and that might not sound interesting, but Kishimoto makes makes it work really well. Act 1. 
If I could describe this arc in one word, it would be cathartic and focused. Having come off the back of a rip-roaring couple of arcs with more conflict than you could swing a cat at, going into this, I was curious to see the direction Kishimoto was going to take. Sure, we'd have to deal with the aftermath of the attack on the village and Lady Tsunade settling into her new position, but outside of that, I didn't see much else to deal with outside of perhaps the Itachi and Sasuke conflict. In the last arc, while I didn't speak much about it, Itachi very much cemented himself as one of the most terrifying major players in the story. As soon as he appeared on the other side of the door facing Naruto, I sincerely felt the tension and pressure rise, which is exactly the sort of impression you want from a major villain or antagonist. And the action and drama that took fuel from that encounter as Sasuke entered the fray to make the save on Naruto, it felt like a monumental moment in every sense of the word that was building to something. However then, the rug is pulled from beneath us. Despite the other arcs that make up the rest of this first part of Naruto being somewhat more complex, with a greater number of moving parts, this arc and its eight volumes primarily concern themselves with Sasuke's relationship with his brother and the choices he makes in seeking revenge in response to that. And I loved it. My biggest complaint after I finished the very first arc of Naruto was that it felt somewhat unfocused. And now in this arc, not only are things incredibly simple, but each facet of this arc now receives ample attention. Sasuke! Sasuke vs Naruto Round 1 Funnily enough, despite being mentioned once before that Sasuke desired to test himself against Naruto, this matchup for one reason or another faded into the back of my subconscious as something I either didn't know I wanted or one that I totally forgot about. And I have no idea why because on paper these two squaring off makes complete sense and are a terrific matchup narratively speaking. I mentioned before in an earlier video that I felt the closer Naruto came to achieving his goal, the farther away Sasuke would be pushed by his. With Orochimaru having laid that metaphorical Chekhov's gun before us when he said Sasuke needs to seek out more power by embracing the darkness in his heart, I knew a scene or sequence of events would play out like this, and it's so much better than I thought it would be, made possible thanks to some key pieces of symbolism laid out across this series. The initial fight that kicks off this arc's activity is short but punctuated powerfully by a striking visual by really putting into perspective the gap that's appearing between himself and Naruto. However, at this point in the story, I think it's important to point out that their relationship isn't necessarily necessarily interesting to me because of their dynamic on its own, and that largely has to do with Kakashi and Jiraiya pretty much telling us explicitly what's happening narratively between them. We're not left to understand this on our own by reading the material and understanding it ourselves, and as a result this exposition feels clunky and did take away from this short but opening fight between them. Then again, this is a manga for young teens, so I'm gonna let it slide. I will however say what I did really enjoy was the role mentors are playing in this story. Whether that be Kakashi and Sasuke, which I will definitely speak about more later, Jiraiya's relationship with Naruto as I've described in the past, Sakura's new budding relationship with Lady Tsunade, and of course Guy's relationship with Rock Lee. Rock Lee's been an interesting character in this story. From the moment I met him back during the tuning exams, I knew I liked this little guy. With him time and time again throughout the story, whether it be in the force of death, the fight with Gara, or his rehabilitation after that fight, he sort of, in a way, stood as an example of what a hero with a similar mentality to that of Naruto might appear like if he didn't have an all-powerful spirit trapped within him. When Naruto, in the first half of this story, contended with inadequacy and a chip on his shoulder, eventually Kishimoto was forced to transition his character from one that struggled to make a difference to one who had to deal with the high expectations from those around him. Lee, on the other hand, because of the lack of advantages he has compared to Naruto, can fully lean into and embrace angles an outcast character like Naruto once was afforded. Naruto can self-heal thanks to the fox spirit inside him, and so a natural way to explore Lee's character to further distinguish him from Naruto is to have him absorb a tremendous amount of damage and the consequences of that action. Which brings me to his mentor guy. In many ways, the mentor characters in this story mirror key attributes of their students' personalities. Guy is perhaps the most pronounced variation on this concept. Everything from his appearance to his desire to prove himself against Kakashi to his soul-destroying training exercises. In every sense of the word, the connection between Guy and Lee is as powerful as it is because they feel like father and son. 
once again providing Lee in this story horrific odds for anyone to have to face, let alone a young teenager. I spoke about Guy before in a prior part saying that I thought he saw a tremendous amount of himself in Lee and due to that sees him as something of an inspiration to even him. And while that was true, in this arc their relationship is tested as Guy comes face to face with the consequences of the path he laid this young boy down. And so he's faced with a dilemma. Does he encourage him like he always had? To look the odds in the eye unblinking and take the surgery which has a 50% mortality rate? Or does he choose to discourage him out of sympathy for his situation? It's a tremendous amount of responsibility and it's a fascinating character study within this arc that I think has the most emotional resonance. If you're in the market for new wireless earbuds that offer the same quality as premium brand at half the price, then Raycon's Everyday Earbuds are exactly what you need. They've got a super slick rubber oil look and feel that, at least to me, look pretty damn great and match their premium sound. With a whole bunch of gel tips available, they've always got a perfect in-ear fit too. I've been using mine for several months now and they've quickly become the best earbuds I've ever owned. Whether I'm just out and about walking my dogs or sat at home writing videos like these, they've got me covered. With a built-in mic, I can take calls at the press of a button and even leave voice memos for myself. The fact it's got 8 hours of constant playtime and a 32 hour battery life means they're always ready to go whenever I need them. If you're interested, click the link in the description box or go to buyraycon.com forward slash notmark to unlock exclusive deals up to 20% off your Raycon order. With a 45 day happiness guarantee, if you don't love them, you can send them right back. Eu sou Naruto Uzumaki. Faça parte da minha jornada ninja. Seja meu aliado agora. Acesse narutoonline.tv. Acesse os golpes, lute com coragem, dane-se o Hokage assim como eu. Totalmente grátis. É só acessar narutoonline.tv. Viva seu lado ninja. Reviva a aventura ninja de Naruto Uzumaki. Act 2. The scene where Sasuke chooses to leave to connect with the dark side is actually a lot more effective than I thought it would be. It's certainly not profound or anything like that, but it really does feel authentic and honest to the characters involved, which is the most important thing. In this scene, Sakura tries her best to persuade Sasuke to stay with them, and in doing so, pours her heart out in a tender, albeit awkward scene, which I honestly thought was appropriate and, well, perfect. They are just kids, after all, struggling to navigate the minefield that is expressing how they feel about each other while under extreme stress with little practice in that area. And it absolutely came across that way. I really did feel sorry for Sakura during this part and while I don't vibe too much with her as a character, I did think this felt very authentic and appropriate for her. And following Sasuke leaving, the foundation is now set for the chase that will follow that day, with none other than Shikamaru, now a Chunin, being tasked with assembling a team. Interestingly, while Naruto was the obvious choice and is chosen to be part of that team, Neji Kiba and Choji were less expected by me, but absolutely welcomed in my mind. The chase that eventually gets underway I thought was brilliant. While there was a little bit of a slow burn towards the middle, I definitely thought the attention given to the fights really helped the pacing, as well as elevate the various characters that otherwise didn't get the attention they deserved earlier in this story. Shikamaru, while having been given some shine in prior arcs, now leads the group of young ninja with an impressive and strategic fashion that absolutely highlighted not only his upside as a leader and strategist, but when things didn't go 100% to plan with his group's numbers dwindling, it also led him to question himself, wondering if he was good enough, which, for such a certain and calculated character, really helped to humanize him in a way I wasn't expecting, grounding him while also exhibiting his greatest strengths and techniques. And really, that's what this middle section does exceptionally well. It helps to re-establish these lesser known and seldom focused on characters, offers them the chance to show their absolute best and shows their internal struggles and doubts. The way this chase is organized, it acts as a sort of conga line, for lack of a better term, of Orochimaru's goons to get through, and so, one after another, part of Shikamaru's team has to drop off to fight each member of this group as they continue to carry Sasuke off in a basket for Orochimaru to take the body of. Choji's fight is first, and honestly, when I look at Neji's and Kiba's alongside this, I thought this one did it best. The rest follow a very similar format to this, and so on top of it benefiting from being the first time we see this sort of sequence and format, I think there's a lot more we can dig into with this material seeing as Neji, for example, already had an emotionally charged fight with Naruto during the tuning exams that dealt with much of the same subject matter discussed in this fight specifically. Furthermore, Choji has this. 
Lumber. So I guess Kishimoto took a leaf out of One Piece's playbook and gave Choji rumble balls. And man, does he get massive during this. Honestly, I didn't know what to expect with this, but once again, similar to what made Shikamaru effective during this section, the conflict Choji endures serves as a great vehicle to demonstrate his skills that make him unique, but it also highlights his insecurities and shortcomings as a ninja and a human being too. I think out of all the fights in this section, Choji's was by far my favorite. And while I was reading through this material too, I was shocked by how fast I was flying through it. The fights in this section felt both compelling and brief, with the likes of Choji and Neji receiving plenty of wonderful two-page spreads while also demonstrating these sound ninjas' second forms, acting as a foreshadowing of things to come for Sasuke. I thought the second form designs of sound ninjas brandish were phenomenal. I wasn't so sure about them each getting a new transformation at first though. I thought the effect would get lessened each and every time with it being more and more formulaic. But in actuality, because the designs were so great, I actually ended up getting hyped for what they would eventually look like when they did change. Furthermore, once Naruto and Shikamaru's respective fights get underway, then the tempo really starts to ramp up. Particularly when it comes to Naruto's fight with this strange new character coming to take the basket housing Sasuke away. Naruto assumes that feral mode he slips into when his friends are in danger, and the artwork accompanying it is appropriately awesome. However, things as they often do during stories go to shit, and when they did here, something amazing happened. Lee fucking arrives to make this save. I'm not sure if my energy in this recording will accurately show just how excited I felt when he showed up, but I went bananas because honestly, I love this little character. I spoke about how the last few volumes and fights really felt somewhat formulaic in that they effectively achieved the same sort of things narratively. But that formula has been thrown right out the window and replaced with the pure chaos Lee has injected into this fight. However, as things want to go in this story, we can't have too much of a good thing for too long. But that doesn't mean what we receive as a replacement isn't great also. At the beginning of Volume 24, Kishimoto reminisced about his experience reading Dragon Ball Volume 24 for the first time and how that was where Goku fought against Ginyu. He described the affair as something he was massively excited to read through and hoped that he could make Naruto more exciting. When I opened that volume after reading nothing but what felt like quite safe choices up until now, this volume exploded with interest, near impossible to predict matchups, and last minute saves. Like the fight with Lee and his drunken monkey technique, which was hilarious and surprisingly effective against the worsening odds right after his surgery. And then Gara and the other sand ninjas show up. I'm not even remotely kidding here, it's felt like more has happened in the last five chapters than there has been in the last four volumes. It's honestly brilliant stuff. Kimimaro is a brilliant looking villain and his fight against Lee and eventually Gara is brilliantly handled. He is one of the most unsettling and awesome looking ninjas I've come across in this story. And when he whipped out his spine and used it as a sword, I was like, okay, look, I know I'm not a big fan of action only moments, but that was really freaking cool. This fight is honestly not one I would ever have thought to create if left to my own devices, but the two powers on display here, sand manipulation and bone manipulation, created perhaps the most visually stunning battle sequence I've seen from this manga to date. Defensively, offensively, and the strategy employed by both warriors was enough to win my heart a million times over. And throwing Lee into the mix only served to exacerbate that feeling for me. Watching these two one-time enemies work together and in a sense save each other was immensely satisfying. And we're not done yet. There are moments in pop culture where you have to sit back and recognize that this was a moment not only pivotal to the story that it takes part in, but one that has influenced and impacted the lives of millions around the world. For me, that moment was Goku versus Vegeta. It was the very first piece of material I ever saw of Dragon Ball, and because of the impact that had on my life, I've gone on to make it my career. And this fight, Sasuke versus Naruto, this really and truly felt like the culmination of the entire series. Conveyed perfectly by Kishimoto as the strengths Naruto has garnered across his time spent with us are all used here to full effect. From his most bombastic and ostentatious abilities like the Shadow Clones and the Rasengan, all the way to the more subtle touches like when he learned to walk on water with Jiraiya. All of these skills are on display here and used to full effect serving to heighten the drama and make this feel 
like we've reached a significant end point. What did catch me off guard, however, was that a massive portion of this fight is spent in flashback. A brilliant flashback, but it surprised me nevertheless. The flashback for Sasuke, while long, added so much to an occasion that felt as though it was starved of Sasuke's perspective. We got to see the decaying of Sasuke's relationship with his brother and the origins of his entire purpose in life to get revenge. But one thing I will say about this before I move on is that I get the feeling that we're missing a large part of this story, namely Itachi's perspective on everything. Now, it might very well just turn out to be the case that he's a cold-blooded murderer that has no redeemable qualities, but who knows, I'll see how that plays out in the future. Concerning the fight itself, the action in the opening minutes felt appropriately shocking and confusing due to Naruto's perspective. However, once the flashback revealing Sasuke's motivations and full backstory concluded, the fight suddenly felt both appropriate for each respective character and, most importantly, perfectly focused. The paneling and layout work by Kishimoto, as I mentioned earlier with the Gara and Rock Lee encounter, is some of the best in the series with Kishimoto really demonstrating how far he's come as an artist, going from strength to strength leading to Naruto charging up his Rasengan and Sasuke his Chidori, with the paneling accompanying this being stronger than anywhere else I've seen in the manga. There's a point of view shot from underwater as we look on as these two ninjas dance on the water's surface, with their weapons floating down to the dark depths beneath, and that might be my favourite page out of the entire conflict here. However, if I want to take a step back for a second and think about things more abstractly, it is my belief that the flashback we get after this concerning Kakashi's origins holds a lot more meaning behind it than might be evident at first glance. In this flashback, Kakashi's team is composed of three individuals. Himself, a young boy called Obito Uchiha, and a girl called Rin. And from this reflection on his early training days, we can see why perhaps he's taken a keen interest in Sasuke, taking him under his wing, seeking to teach him the Chidori technique. Of that original group, Obito was clearly the overly emotional underachiever like Naruto was in Sasuke's group, while Rin could be a very convincing stand-in for Sakura, given that Sakura herself would begin studying the same jutsu Rin was. However, while reading this material, I couldn't help but cast my mind back to the first arc where Naruto, Sasuke, and Sakura sat before Kakashi. In that very scene, Sasuke explained in no uncertain terms what his goals were, demonstrating his single-minded approach in becoming a ninja, and over the course of that story, this focus has remained. And with the farther and farther he pursued that line of thinking, Kakashi began getting more and more interested and involved in Sasuke's life, and I think there's a reason for it. He saw himself in Sasuke. Kakashi's flashback, wherein we first see him use the Tidori technique, he does so not taking into account how his actions will affect his teammates. Single-minded also in his goal, he ends up failing in that effort for the most part, and later in that same flashback, Rin gets kidnapped. Obito wants to rescue her, but Kakashi insists on completing the mission instead. Thankfully, the comparatively weaker Obito convinces Kakashi to save her too, and from this, it's clear to see the similarities Kakashi sees in Sasuke, particularly striking for Kakashi given that he loves lost a close friend in the process of that mission. It's a touching flashback, highlighting the origins of his eye, but for me, it highlighted instead the birth of who Kakashi is today. By the end of that sequence, the Chidori becomes a technique not exclusively of destruction, but one that instead represents protection of his closest loved ones, which recontextualized every instance he used that move in the series for me. However, if we are to think about this one layer deeper, his teaching of this technique to Sasuke, with his explicit explanation of when to use this technique, it effectively acts as Kakashi handing Sasuke a representation of one's desire to protect what's most important to him, hoping that it will become that for him, to help him see what's actually important, to focus on what you have right now instead of what you lost. And so, when this story climaxes in the emphatic and grand fashion it does, Naruto's Rasengan explodes on contact with Sasuke's Chidori to create a stunning inferno of a spectacle no doubt, but it's also a collision of two techniques that offer snapshots of how far one has come and how far astray the other has fallen. The act and display of these techniques alone perfectly tell the story of these two fierce characters in a very real and metaphorical sense, with the technique that was designed to protect those close to you very literally being used in this instance to tear down the one closest to Sasuke. This arc wears many different masks. It's a character-driven drama, it's a comedy, it's action, and it's a thriller. But in the end, this has become a story about two characters more than anything else. And in the end, Naruto's first part ends in tragedy. Or does it? The choice Sasuke made to not kill Naruto says more about his character than 
this entire fight ever could. And it's rather fitting that a technique like Chidori couldn't be used to end the life of his friend. Overall, my impressions of this arc and really this first section of Naruto is a wonderful one. While it didn't start strong like many other series do, Kishimoto, and by extension this story, has a passion behind it that much like its titular character grew and grew more effective with each subsequent arc. I've transformed from someone that didn't know the first thing about Naruto, and now I consider myself a massive fan of Kishimoto and the work he's produced here with this section of the story. The arc was a massive finale befitting of the occasion that managed to also feel intimate at the same time. I can't wait to see where the story goes from here and I honestly hope you guys will join me for the ride. But before we wrap things up, I want to quickly plug a really cool podcast I was on. Amazon Prime Video has put together an anime podcast called Anime to Z, hosted by rapper Shay Lingo and comedian Beck Hill. They had me on to review the Vinland Saga anime, so if you're interested in my thoughts on that show, my episode will be out tomorrow as of this video's upload. I'll drop a link in the description for anyone who wants to check it out. Subscribe if you want to see more when I start reading Shippuden next week. But until then, I've been Toy Not Mark, and thank you so much for watching. So,